On this hot summer day, Charlotte and Albert Morgan woke up earlier than usual, and it wasn't the incessant barking of the neighbor's dog that was the reason why the elderly couple woke up so early. It was probably the fact that they were always in a terrible mood on this day. After all, it was the day on which, five years earlier, their daughter Anna had died in a terrible plane crash. And even though so much time had passed, Charlotte still blamed herself every day for everything that had happened. Had she not been so strict with Diana, this tragedy could have been avoided. As he gazed at the photographs of his late daughter in response to his wife's words, Mr. Morgan listened sympathetically as he felt the intense guilt stir deep in his soul. As a child, Diana had always been an intelligent and obedient child who quickly found common ground for dialogue with her parents. Still, the older she grew, the more her rebellious nature became pronounced. Her character led Diana to do crazy and often unpredictable things. Diana's parents tried to influence their daughter in every possible way, but their efforts were always in vain. When Diana became an adult, she enrolled in college. Three years later, however, she was expelled for excessive absences and poor performance, according to her professors. Diana was also worried about her new boyfriend, who eventually rejected her. Of course, this news was unpleasant for Diana's parents, as they had long dreamed of their daughter's success in the field of economics or law. After leaving the university, Diana rented a house on the city's outskirts, where she lived with her fiancé. That was when Mrs. Morgan made a fatal mistake, which, in her opinion, caused her daughter's death. Mrs. Morgan was outraged by her daughter's behavior and flatly refused to meet her fiancé, whom she considered a nobody. This caused a rift in the mother-daughter relationship, which lasted almost four years and ended with Diana's death in a plane crash. In the first hours after the crash, Morgan was still hopeful that her daughter had miraculously survived. Still, when the rescue teams recovered Diana's personal effects, her hopes were crushed entirely before her eyes. Then Mrs. Morgan looked at the photograph of her now deceased daughter and realized that no personal agenda should ever have been the cause of a quarrel with someone so near and dear. Why don't we have some relatives over tonight? Let's have a memorial dinner in Diana's honor, the number it's been five years after all, as Mr. Morgan cautiously suggested. Mrs. Morgan just pouted and shook her head in response. Mrs. Morgan wanted to be alone on this momentous day, reserved for her grief and longing for her beloved daughter. She knew very well that her relatives would be on leave for a while and that she would be plagued with guilt. For a short time, Mrs. Morgan was brought out of her grief and mourning by the persistent ringing of the phone. She wondered who it could be. She immediately picked up the phone. Hello, Grandma. How are you? It's your grandson, Kevin, said a little boy's voice on the other end of the line. Sorry, kid, you have it wrong, honey, said Mrs. Morgan, trying not to get too excited. No, Grandma, no, it's Kevin. Mom left me your phone number. She died in a plane crash, and I'm in an orphanage, actually in the parking lot, because we're not allowed to use the phone. It's awful here. Grandma, please come get me out of here. I wonder what that unknown boy meant, but his voice made a good impression on Mrs. Morgan. Of course, Mrs. Morgan understands that little kids make these kinds of mistakes, and the boy could easily dial the wrong phone, she thought. Not knowing what to do with this information, Mrs. Morgan decided to confide in her husband. This is a very curious story. Perhaps we should visit the orphanage and talk to the boy personally, Mr. Morgan suggested. Mrs. Morgan laughed approvingly and told him she was excited to see if this boy who claimed to be her grandson looked like her daughter. But to the couple's surprise, the orphanage management told them, We didn't know about your daughter, but Kevin has a completely different name, said the orphanage director, emphasizing the boy's last name. Stephen Hall had been the director of the orphanage for the last 15 years and thought he had seen it all, and so Mrs. Morgan's words didn't shake him, no matter how much she insisted that the nine-year-old orphan was her grandson. Mr. Hall, please allow me at least one meeting with Kevin. After everything that he's been through, he might have been able to talk directly to me, which means he might know something, Mrs. Morgan demanded. The director could not return to his word and decided to allow Mrs. Morgan to come in to see the boy. When Kevin appeared in the large guest room, Mrs. Morgan turned pale and almost fainted, 
the nine-year-old boy looked exactly like Mrs. Morgan's late daughter, with the same messy sandy blonde hair and those blue eyes full of joy and life. Hi, Grandma, said the little boy with a smile. Hi, Kevin. I'm so glad to see you. Tell me, how did you find me? asked Mrs. Morgan. Carefully, Kevin looked at the woman for a moment before he let out a deep sigh and began to tell his story. Kevin revealed that he remembered almost nothing of his past. When his mother died, Kevin revealed that he could remember nothing of his past. Kevin was only four years old when his mother died, and he didn't even know her name. Kevin vaguely remembered being taken to the orphanage by an older woman, who left him the boy's name along with the phone number of his relatives. The orphanage staff dialed the numbers immediately, but no one answered. Assuming the old lady had made a mistake, the caretakers followed protocol by entering the phone number into the boy's file and leaving it in the files on the bookshelf. It was only by coincidence that Kevin could find it. Five years ago, there was a big storm in the Northwest, and fallen trees must have damaged the phone lines, Mrs. Morgan whispered, feeling like all the pieces were starting to fit together. The orphanage staff was probably too lazy not to try to call back and separated Kevin from his family for five years. Grandma, do you want to take me home? Some of my friends have already been adopted, but no one seems to want to take me, Kevin said, already starting to sob. Of course I will. You can be sure I'll just find the papers I need to fill out, she replied. Mrs. Morgan spoke and kissed the child's hair. But when she expressed her intention to the orphanage director, he was bitterly disappointed. Mrs. Morgan, the child's adoption is out of the question at this point. First, you still have no proof of being related. Secondly, you and your husband are no longer young. What would Kevin do if something happened to you? If you find proof that you are Kevin's grandmother, you would be welcome to adopt him, but I wouldn't recommend it, replied Stephen Hall in a voice a little sharper than it should have been. At that moment, Mrs. Morgan felt as if the temperature in the office was plummeting. She had barely managed to contain her emotions, drying her eyes with a handkerchief. Mrs. Morgan replied in a dry, formal voice. Okay, Mr. Hall, I'll join you with the evidence of kinship. Mrs. Morgan realized her unusual case could only be helped by genetic testing to confirm her relationship with Kevin. Without further delay, Mrs. Morgan sent one of the DNA test requests to the authorities. Unfortunately, it took a month before permission was granted and another few months to test and compare the samples from Mrs. Morgan and her alleged grandson, Kevin. Mrs. Morgan did not just sit back and wait, but began investigating her daughter's history. What she discovered was that Diana Morgan had never married and that her fiancé had abandoned her shortly after the birth of their child. Mrs. Morgan was terrified at the thought of what her daughter, a single mother, must have gone through. All this time, Diana never asked me for help. I was a proud fool waiting for her to call me first, the old woman thought, bitterly regretful. Mrs. Morgan even found the address where her daughter lived with her newborn grandson five years ago. The woman who lived there said she was the only one who had occupied the house since then and had taken Diana's four-year-old child to the orphanage. She tried to call Mrs. Morgan. Still, on that faithful day, a hurricane cut telephone services to the northern part of the city. Mrs. Morgan finally understood everyone's motives five years after the plane crash. She realized that the past could not be changed and sincerely wanted to help Kevin. Mr. Morgan fully supported his wife, who was very happy with their grandson, suddenly appearing in their lives. But when the DNA results came back, it was discovered that Kevin was not their grandson. How was this possible? I know Kevin is my flesh and blood. Mrs. Morgan sat, holding the piece of paper, and in response, her husband slammed his hand on the table and declared, I don't care what the DNA tests say. I'm willing to take custody of Kevin. It doesn't matter what the test says. Mrs. Morgan's face lit up, for her husband's words were a glimmer of hope flickering in her eyes. They were going to do everything they could to get custody of the child. She had fallen so much in love with Kevin that she was even willing to take care of him without being related. When it was finally time to take Kevin from the orphanage, a letter of apology arrived in the mail on behalf of the director of the genetic research clinic. On the day of the DNA test, the testing team made a fatal error in the samples. For Charlotte and Albert Morgan, this meant only one thing. 
it was very likely that Kevin was their biological grandson. I always knew you would take me home, Kevin exclaimed as he looked at her saying goodbye to the orphanage. As he held his grandparents' hands, the little boy laughed happily and was very content. Kevin was now confident that his family would never abandon him. He knew he would be loved until the end of his days.